to press time. Oh, yeah, you don't have to. Correct. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this uh, joint meeting of the CPF Bo C CMAP Board and the Policy uh, Committee. As a reminder, if you haven't already, please be sure to complete the sign in sheet out in the hallway before you leave. If you want to make a public comment, please comment. Please complete the public comment card and drop it off to CMAP staff. Um, this meeting is being live streamed in order for those to online to hear what is being said in the room. It is critical that we all use the microphones when speaking. We will need to continue. You will need to continuously hold the button down on the mic when speaking. Well, it looks like maybe not. Yeah. So that oh, might they be changed old. that, so you don't have to do that. How's that? Uh, for those participating Zoom, please keep your microphones muted unless you're called upon to speak when appropriate. <coughs> in the agenda, we will request comments from those online, and you can indicate your desire to speak via the chat box. Staff is monitoring Zoom and will recognize you when it's your turn to speak. With that, Aaron, please call the roll. Okay, see me up board. Thank you. Uh, Mayor Bennett? Present. Frank Beal? Present. President Brawley? Present. Mayor Curry? Mayor Grasso? Here. Mayor Hofert? Here. Ne Nina Itamudia? Here. Mayor Nope? Here. President Reinbold? Here. John Robertson? Here. Mayor Rotering? Uh, Joanna Ruiz? Here. Carolyn Schofield? Here. Ann Sheehan? Here. Matt Walsh? Leanne Redden? Here. And uh, Dr. Koris Mohammadian. We have uh, some people on Zoom and uh, Required by law, we need to entertain a motion to allow those people to participate, participate in the meeting. Is there a motion? Second. And again, identify yourselves when you. Uh, I've got Ann <coughs> and Schofield. Thank you. We'll do second. Any questions? If not, all in favor, signify by a vote of aye. 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 Opposed, vote of no. The motion carries. Thank you very much. I'm going to turn it over to Secretary Osmond for the MPO. Yeah, likewise, good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, and Aaron, would you please call the roll for the MPO Policy Committee? Sounds good. And I will ask if the appointed member is not in attendance, if the alternate could please identify themselves by name. I'll call the organization. IDOT? Here. Uh, CDOT? Here. CMAP Beal? Here. CMAP Brawley? Here. CTA? Thank you. Uh, Cook County? Here. Council of Mayors? DuPage County? Steve Travia for Chair Deb Conroy. Thank you. FHWA. Thank you. FTA. Thank you. Uh, Illinois Tollway. Thank you. Uh, Kane County. The Tom Rickard here representing Madam Chair Pirard. Lake County. Shane Schneider on behalf of Chair Hart. McHenry County. Scott Hennings on behalf of Chair Bueller. Metra. Here. Pace. Here. RTA. Present. Will County. Thank you. Class One Railroads. Here. Thank you. And I do think we have a member online. Kane County. We'll come back to that. We do have a quorum of the MPO Policy Committee. Um, just given the fact that we have a, a couple new faces in the room, I want to welcome Steve Travia from DuPage. I believe this is your first MPO meeting. Uh, Joanna Ruiz from the CMAP Board, also her first MPO meeting. And also uh, joining us is uh, Mayor Curry from Linwood on the CMAP board. So some new faces around the room uh, that some of you may have not uh, had at our last meeting, please do. Uh, we appreciate your participation in the regional process and we're excited to have you at our conversation here today. Under executive director's report, right? Yes, thank you. So moving right along, I again just want to welcome everybody to the joint meeting of the MPO and the CMAP board here. Uh, we'll also recognize that Mayor Schilke has arrived for the MPO. Uh, you know, to the members of the MPO and to the members of our board, I hope you all have a, had an enjoyable summer here. 
Um, my update's gonna sound a little bit repetitive to board members because we met last month, but I think there are a number of things that we've had going on that we want to also share with our MPO policy committee members as well. So a few highlights from CMAP events that have been featured prominently recently. You know, I, along with a handful of our team, went to the Association of Metropolitan Planning Organizations Conference uh, held this year in Salt Lake City. Uh, Amy Lee, our transportation deputy, did present on our plan of action for regional transit um, and really uh, joined a number of others uh, around the room, around the country, uh, from the Bay Area, from Metro Washington, who are also grappling with similar challenges around transit and what that regional conversation needs to be. So we learned a lot from that. Um, we also had strong representation at the American Planning Association State Conference in Champaign, where a senior planner, Lily Brack, moderated two panel discussions, one that looked at uh, the work that we are doing with the city, or the village of Ford Heights and their strategic plan, and also the work that we're doing in Logan Square around the transit action plan, and then talked a lot about um, Cook County's use of ARPA funds for capital investments, so really trying to highlight the good work that we are doing in partnership with many of you around the table here. Uh, policy principal Elizabeth Scott also led a discussion on the challenges facing public transit and the plan of action for regional transit. Uh, as a case study, Jamie Jackson, a planner on our team, facilitated a speed planning session. And our new planner, Gabriel Guevara, won APA Illinois' Emerging Planner Award. So we are excited to have him on the team here as well. And congratulations to him. Uh, so as you may have seen in my director's report on the agenda that um, we also included some communication and engagement quarterly report. We're consistently trying to engage the public on a number of our projects that, that we care about, but also the partners uh, projects that we're working on in partnership like the safety action plans. In quarter one of FY25, so July through September, we had 45 events across six of our seven counties, uh, a number that I'm really proud of. And as we get back to sort of full in-person business, uh, we want to continuously be out there. So if there are things that we should be doing or areas of the region that we should be engaged in, please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, we didn't make it to Kendall County this summer, but the number is actually a little bit lower than our, low, uh, than our average, which is usually about 80 activities over the summer um, across our seven county region. Uh, also, just a professional announcement here. I'm proud to announce that last Friday I was awarded the Leadership in Public Service Award from the March of Dimes at their annual construction and transportation luncheon. A, a true honor and an unexpected honor, but um, uh, just reflective of the work that we do here at the agency and that, that, uh, that I really uh, truly appreciate, but I, I recognize that I couldn't do it without all of you here around the table as well. So thanks to you all. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, next, uh, uh, an update particularly relevant for the MPO committee as we haven't met, but at our June meeting of the MPO, CMAP, IDOT, and CTA participated in the workshop led by US DOT's Build America Bureau on 290 and the CTA Blue Line Corridor. As a result of that workshop, CMAP issued an RFP to establish a corridor development office for the corridor. Over the course of the summer, CTA, IDOT, and CMAP together reviewed and evaluated responsive proposals, and at the September board meeting, a contract was approved for uh, global engineering and construction firm CDM Smith and their diverse team of subconsultants to assist us as the Corridor Development Office's program servicer. So the team included four DBE firms with participation, 39% uh, exceeding our 25% goal here. This partnership between ITA, I, IDOT, CTA, and CMAP, our goal really is to improve coordination as we pursue funding uh, for the coordinated uh, efforts to revitalize this corridor, this important corridor. So really thinking about strategic planning towards visioning, uh, sequencing of projects, developing those funding plans, and supporting joint coordination with our federal partners, but also with our local partners that are numerous across the, the corridor. So as we continue to get things underway, we will bring that project to you all and, and update you on the process and the progress that we make over the next few years on that. Also wanted to announce that we've launched our travel household survey called My Daily Travel. Again, this is something that helps us understand how uh, people across our region are traveling, how they're utilizing transit, 
or other modes of transportation to get to the places that they need to go. Uh, we hope to hear back from at least 4,000 participants across the region. This helps us really calibrate our models as we think about you know, who might use these systems and, and how different people might be changing those travel patterns post-pandemic as well. So uh, we've got a couple hundred surveys completed in the first few weeks, so off to a strong start here. Um, thanks to you all for, for sh spreading the word here. If you do want to find out a little bit more, you can go to mydailytravelsurvey.com, but the survey is by invitation only because we are hoping to get a statistically significant response right here. And then speaking of surveys, the CMAP Biennial Municipal Survey is going on now. Again, this really helps us understand what sort of resources we as an agency need to be providing to our municipalities across the region. So there are questions related to climate, accessibility, transportation safety, among other topic areas here. We've reached out to all 284 of our municipalities to encourage their participation, and the survey runs through Friday, October 18th here. So this, again, really helps us drive our, our technical assistance offerings across the region. And then just a couple other quick updates here for you. The ADA coordinators group, we're kicking off a series of coordinator, acts, uh, coordinator group convenings across the region as part of our ADA program. I'm proud to say that over the last couple of years since we've started this program, we've held 16 compliance trainings throughout the region attended by almost 500 individuals representing 150 different organizations, including 86 municipalities across the region. We're also working directly with communities to create self-evaluation plans and those tr transition plans for the public right away. Um, and uh, I think in future news, so starting later this month, October 21st, we will do our project uh, call for applications for our CMAC, a carbon reduction and surface transportation program shared fund and the transportation alternatives fund. So again, these programs fund projects that are aimed at reducing emissions and improving traffic congestion, enhancing regional transportation infrastructure, as well as supporting non-motorized transportation. So if you or partners that you work with are interested in pursuing funding through those pots, know that on October 25th, 21st, that call for projects will open and we will have more details on our website there. Finally, a little legislative update here. Uh, I know we'll have that on the agendas uh, a little bit later here, but we are following closely all the legislative activity related to transit reform, as are many of you, I'm sure. Uh, we did have the opportunity to talk to the House Public Transit Working Group on the part report last month and look forward to continuing to be a resource of information to that group. Uh, additionally, the Illinois Legislative Latino Caucus Foundation hosted a discussion here at the old post office, of which we also participated with the legislators, um, and really talked to them about how transit continues to support larger climate, economic, and equity goals here across the region. So our next board meeting is scheduled for November 13th and our next policy meeting will take place in the new year and we will be back upstairs in our regular offices. So I am happy to take any questions with that lengthy update. Thank you for your patience. Any questions of Aaron? If not. I'll keep moving. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Secretary, I think you have a minute to approve. <coughs> yes. Um, the meeting we had on June 13, 2024, has been uh, has been attached to the uh, to the invite. So I move. Um, I will be entertaining a motion to approve the meeting minutes from June 13, 2024. There are motions from Lake County. Thank you. Okay. All in favor, say aye. All opposed say. Okay. Go ahead. All opposed say nay. Motion carried. Thank you. Just for the record, the motion was cooked and seconded by Lake County. Okay. The chair would also like to rec recognize CMAP board member Matt Walsh being present. For the members of the CMAP board, you have before you under the consent agreement uh, the minutes of the September 11th meeting. We have three contracts uh, authorization to amend contract. C24-00066 with Energy and Environmental Economics, Inc. for a comprehensive climate action plan technical assistance for an additional amount of $71,000 for a total not to exceed $511,000. The second one is an authorization to amend contract C23-0029 with ICF Incorporated, LLC for resilient 
Improvement program for the additional amount of $50,000 for a not to exceed total amount of 885000 And the last item is authorization to amend contract C24-0047 with SRF Consulting Group, Inc. for Northwest Cook Transit Coordinating Study, Coordination Study and for an amount of $29,725.21 for a total not to exceed $220,100. I'll entertain a motion to approve the consent items 302, 401 to 403. Motion to note. Moved and seconded. Any questions? If not, all in favor signify by a vote of aye. 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 Opposed, a vote of no. And a motion carries. Moving on to regular agenda items. I think next up is the uh, MBO, MPO policy committee, I think, uh, the schedule for 2025. The schedule has been attached to the meeting invite. Uh, it might be in your packet. Uh, and I do move. Uh, I do entertain a motion to approve the MPO policy committee meeting schedule for 2025. Second. Second, RTA. Right. All in favor, uh, say aye. aye. All opposed, say nay. Motion carried. You have the election of the MPO Policy Committee, yeah. Mr. Secretary? Which one is it? Okay. We are moving into item 5.02, which is the election of MPO Policy Committee Vice Chair. With that, Amy Lee. Uh, Deputy of Research, Analysis, and Programming will provide the MPO nominating committee recommendation. Good morning. Good morning. Um, following uh, the meeting of the nominating committee, we are now moving forward with a recommendation to nominate uh, Cassandra Rouse, Deputy Executive Director, as the next Vice Chair for the MPO Policy Committee. Thank you. I will entertain a motion to approve the nomination of Cassandra Rouse as Vice Chair of the MPO Policy Committee for calendar year 2025. Please state your name. So, uh, so moved, request. Second. second. <clears throat> All in favor say aye. aye. All opposed say nay. The motion carried. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Item uh, 503, this is a memorandum or MOU, which we have annually done with the CMAP Board Policy Committee. Erin? Yes, thank you. Uh, when, when CMAP was created 20 years ago, the CMAP Board and the MPO Policy Committee were com combined. Uh, the agency was a combination of two different organizations here. Um, both bodies uh, jointly adopted an MOU that's the framework for integrating land use and transportation planning for the seven county. Uh, region that we represent. No changes at this time are being recommended uh, of the MOU, but we are requesting that both bodies approve and reaffirm the this MOU, um, really uh, requesting that we continue to work in collaboration on both the land use and transportation issues together here at the region. There's a motion by the CMAP board to motion uh, approved. No. Moved by. You got him too? Mm -hmm. Moved and seconded. Any questions? If not, all those in favor of signify by vote of aye. Opposed, vote of no, motion carries. Mr. Secretary. All right, and likewise, can I get a motion to approve the MOU between the CMAP Board and, and the MPO Policy Committee? Second. Second, Cook. Cook, second. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed, say nay. The motion carries. And I should have said, uh, we, Cassandra, we look forward to welcoming you to sit in the vice chair's seat uh, starting next year. Thank you very much. I look forward to it as well. Congratulations. Congratulations. Under item 601, the CMAP board report. Is there any given that? Yeah. Sorry? I think that's me. Um, that is I, you, Leanne. That is me. Um, I feel like it's a little redundant. Aaron kind of covered a lot of it. So I will just kind of hit some hard, just to, this is the CMAP board report to the MPO, if anyone's confused. Uh, the uh, board didn't meet in July or August, uh, and Erin sort of touched on some of these things, but at the September 11th meeting, 
Uh, the board received an update on the Greater Chicago Land Economic Partnership regarding the efforts that have been made during the first year of the partnership and look for and a look at sort of future work to come on board with that. Also received a brief update on upcoming amendments to the bylaws pursuant to changes passed in uh, Public Act 103. 0986, and just for a refresher for people, uh, the Public Act amends the four-fifths requirement of the board members in office to allow for a simple majority vote for contracts, except uh, the executive directors uh, pertaining to their employment of the executive director, I should say. Uh, and it also connects to grants and purchase agreements and meeting minutes, so moving to that uh, simple majority there. Uh, the Public Act becomes effective uh, January 1st, 2025, and the Board will consider approval of those related bylaws amendments in November. So that concludes the report, but just a um, small matter of indulgence. I would just like to also, I guess I could do this at the end of the meeting, but um, the region, the RTA is hosting with the service boards a, transit, a transportation summit, our second summit on uh, October 24th. It's going to be focusing on suburban service. Uh, invites have actually gone out to all mayors and counties. If you haven't happened to have seen that, reach out to me or anyone on my staff and we can make sure we get that to you again. But we would encourage uh, participation. It will be the afternoon of the 24th in Arlington Heights. So with that, I will turn it back to you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Liam. Under the Council Mayor's Executive Committee report, is the Mayor Shockey going to give that? Or? Yep. He's here. Oh, I didn't see you come in, Jeff. Welcome. Uh, the Council of Mayors Executive Committee includes representatives from each of the 11 sub-regional councils of mayors and we last met on September 24th. At that meeting, the Council began a discussion of the complex transportation funding process, a conversion conversation that will stretch in over the next several meetings into next year. The September agenda also included an introduction to the social economic forecasts that serve as the anchor for the development of the regional transportation plan. The mayors will continue to provide in local input and guidance on the regional transportation plan. And finally, we've had several mayors, including myself, suggest that we maybe want to have a special meeting or a, a discussion at our next meeting about severe weather trends that are starting to really show themselves in our area. And so I know we've invited some of the weather agency folks over to have a meeting with us, and uh, we will have an open discussion of those complex weather cha challenges and what may be what we're going to see happening in the region. And that kind of concludes my report. I would like to invite anybody here that would like to come and hear the weather conversation. I think it could be an enlightened conversation and one that I'm really pleased that CMAP is more than willing to take on and have as some discussion for our members. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Chuck. Under item 701, the CMAC uh, uh, program midpoint performance plan, uh, Doug Berkson is going to give that presentation. Welcome, Doug. Good morning. Um, the federal performance measures established by the Federal Transportation Bill MAP 21 and refined by the FAST Act and the Infrastructure and Investment and Jobs Act uh, set three specific uh, performance measures that are tied to the Congestion Mitigation and Air Quality Improvement Program, or CMAC. Um, our region receives CMAC funding because we are a non-attainment for the National Ambient Air Quality Standards for ozone. Um, as part of the CMAC performance measures, Northeastern Illinois is also required to develop a performance plan uh, that will cover four-year periods in time. Uh, the first performance plan was started in 2018 and ended in 2022. Uh, the region is currently at the two-year mark of the second performance plan, and the report included in your meeting materials today is the midpoint performance report. Uh, the performance targets reflected in the report were set in 2022 as part of the ONTO 2050 update plan. Um, next slide. Oh. Uh, three performance measures uh, are the peak hour excessive delay, which measures the annual hours of peak hour excessive delay on the national highway system per capita in both northeastern Illinois and northwest Indiana. The second one is the non-SOV travel. Uh, which is the percent of non-single occupancy vehicle travel in the northeastern Illinois and northwest Indiana as measured by the U.S. Census Bureau's uh, American Community Survey data. 
Uh, the total emissions reduction uh, is the estimation of volatile organic compounds and nitrogen oxides emissions that are reduced by CMAQ funded projects shown in kilograms per day. Uh, for both the peak hour excessive delay and the non-SOV travel, uh, we are required to set those targets with our MPO neighbors, the Northwest Indiana Regional Planning Commission. Uh, next slide. Uh, the peak hour excessive delay has met uh, our two-year target of 15.6 hours. While I would like for CMAC to take all the credit uh, for this achievement, it is most likely caused by changes in travel as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, next slide. Uh, for non-SOV travel, um, our two-year assessment is 36.3%, uh, which is above not only our two-year target, but also the four-year target. Uh, this achievement can be tied to uh, work from home demographic uh, growing during the pandemic and then not returning to pre-pandemic levels. Uh, next slide. Uh, for both VOC and NOx, our two-year assessment shows that the region is falling short of the targets. Uh, this can be dry, uh, tied directly to how the targets uh, were created and the fact that projects that have this, that Projects that don't have the same estimated emissions benefit. Um, um, so if a project doesn't go forward, uh, we can't count the benefits of that. And we just, when we were programming, uh, our programming uh, uh, was off just a little bit. Um, also with NOx, uh, we do not see any diesel specific projects obligate funds during this period. Uh, diesel fuel is one of the main contributors of NOx emissions in the region. The midpoint report was turned into IDOT and then shared uh, with FHWA prior to the October 1st deadline. Um, in two years time, we'll begin assessing the progress made on the four year targets and setting new targets uh, for the next performance period. Um, and with that, I'm happy to answer any questions on the report. Any questions of Doug? Thank you, sir. Thank you. Under the, uh, item 702, the Regional Transportation Plan, uh, RTP update, uh, Ryan. Uh, and while Ryan gets up there, I just wanted to provide a quick refresher on our Regional Transportation Plan and our different approaches uh, that we're taking this year as opposed to previous years. So our current Regional Transportation Plan is on to 2050, and the goals and recommendations identify how our seven counties and 284 municipalities address transportation, housing, economic development, open space, environment, and other quality of life issues here. You know, the three guiding principles informed by every recommendation will continue to serve as our pillars for our next RTP, inclusive growth, really making sure that we're focused on growing our economy for everyone across our region, resilience, making sure that we're prepared for both those rapid changes, but also those things that are known and unknown across our region, and that we are prioritizing our limited investments and our resources here, really making sure that we're carefully targeting the best opportunities for us to get that big return on investment for the limited resources that we have here. So at this time, we're uncoupling the vision and the RTP into separate but related documents and processes. And we've had some conversations about this, but I just wanted to provide that context before Ryan talk, starts to talk about the RTP. Again, we will have a, a fully baked uh, climate action uh, research report and plan that we'll talk about a little bit as well here. So building on town to 2050 here, the principles and the vision, the RTP is going to continue to guide our transportation investments for the region, uh, but really with that same planning horizon of 2050. So it allows us the flexibility both to address some new and existing challenges and opportunities and really trying to stay aligned with our overall regional vision that we set in 2050. So on a parallel track, we'll be engaging you all starting next Next year, our partners, our stakeholders on developing a renewed regional vision here, um, again, that will continue to inform and guide all of our work. So uh, just with that sort of quick reminder, let me turn it over to Ryan. Thank you, Aaron. And good morning, everyone. Uh, again, my name is Ryan Tomto. Uh, I use he, him pronouns, uh, and I'm a principal policy analyst here at CMAP and oversee the Transportation Investment Strategy Program, which includes the development of the next regional transportation plan. Um, my presentation today is focused on providing an update on our progress developing the, the Regional Transportation Plan, or RTP. Uh, and in this presentation, I'll highlight the key work coming up in 2025, and then dive a, a bit deeper into the work to develop the financial plan. Um, in the process, we'll use uh, 
in the, in the year ahead to develop a plan that'll help us understand how we will pay for the strategies and investments that are included uh, in the final plan. A few reminders uh, about the RTP. This plan will build on the mobility work included in ONTO 2050 and will maintain a 2050 planning horizon year. The RTP must be updated every four years and is critical for ensuring the region can continue, continue to receive federal funding. To meet federal requirements, the RTP must be adopted by October of 2026. Federal regulations also require the plan be fiscally constrained, meaning the plan must uh, only include investments that can be delivered within the anticipated revenues identified in the plan. This is meant to keep the plan financially realistic and achievable. It's important to emphasize, though, that the RTP is not just a technical document. It's an opportunity for the region to reflect on our vision and goals for, the transpor uh, for our transportation system and to check in on our progress on these goals and use that information to prioritize the policies and strategies that guide transportation investments for the long-term future of Northeastern Illinois. There's a lot of work that goes into developing uh, this type of plan. The process involves revisiting goals and objectives, measuring performance, and forecasting future transportation needs based on how the region will grow and change. Throughout the process, we're asking big picture questions, like what kind of, transpor what kind of transportation system do we want? What are the challenges and opportunities? And how do we get there? This is about making strategic choices uh, to ensure we're addressing current challenges and posi positioning the future so I'm positioning the region for the future. So as you can see here on this chart, uh, there are many streams of work currently underway to develop the plan. Teams are working to collect and analyze data to understand existing conditions and forecast future regional needs. We've also been working to understand the transportation priorities of communities throughout the region. We previously presented on our review of over 30 multimodal transportation plans at the local, regional, state, and federal levels. We've also been on a listening tour, going throughout the region, talking to communities about what transportation priorities are top of mind for them. We've been working with our partners to update policies and processes uh, related to the selection of regionally significant projects, and we've begun the process to develop the RTP's financial plan, which I'll go into greater detail here in a few moments. Throughout these streams of work, we're engaging with our transportation partners and stakeholders, as well as taking an equity-centered approach to public outreach. So looking ahead to 2025, the Board and MPO Policy Committee will see this work come before you at your various reg regularly scheduled meetings. Early next year, we will present on the updated approach for selecting regionally significant projects, which will kick off the process to begin identifying and evaluating them. Uh, for which projects we'll be including in the, in the final plan. In the spring of 2025, we'll bring information on emerging priorities and existing conditions to help inform conversations on prioritizing strategies in the plan uh, that will take place at your re regularly scheduled meetings, as well as in a series of stakeholder forums that will take place later in the summer of next year. These conversations will then inform the selection of a prioritized list of strategies and projects to be included in the plan, um, as well as the financial plan for how we'll, we'll go about paying for them. The process to begin determining those funding options is getting underway now, and I'd like to take a few moments to provide an overview of what all is entailed in that process. So a key part of the RTP is making sure the plan is financially sound. In other words, we have to show that we have enough funding to pay for the investments included in the plan. The financial plan is a required component of the RTP. Specifically, federal regulations require the financial plan demonstrate sufficient funding will be available to cover the multimodal surface transportation investments identified throughout the planning process. To meet these requirements, CMAP must determine the anticipated expenditures and revenue sources necessary to carry out the operation, maintenance, and expansion of the region's transportation system between now and 2050. It's important to note, though, the financial plan isn't a budget. It's more about serving as a tool to help us understand the relationship between investments included in the plan and determine what measures we need to be, need to be taken in order to ensure we have the funding necessary to implement them. 
To do this, we look at federal, state, and local funding, along with transit fares and tolls, to get a full picture of the resources we'll have to work with. This chart shows the revenue sources that were included in the financial plan for ONTU 2050. We start with what are called baseline revenues, which consist of the projected forecasts of all existing federal, state, local revenue sources uh, in, throughout the region uh, that is received for transportation purposes. Baseline revenues included, include system generated, generated revenues, which largely are comprised of tolls and transit fares. Local revenues include, in both local, include both local taxes dedicated to transit, such as the RTA sales tax, and fees collected and dedicated to transportation by local governments, such as county motor fuel taxes and municipal motor vehicle registration fees. State revenues include the state capital program and fees collected by the state and dedicated for transportation, uh, such as motor fuel tax, the sales tax on motor fuel, and motor vehicle registration fees. And finally, uh, federal revenues include both discretionary and formula funding programs. With all these funding sources combined, baseline revenue forecasts for the ONTU 2050 uh, update that was adopted in 2022 uh, were projected to provide a total of $488 billion in revenues. Uh, these baseline revenues alone are not enough to cover the transportation needs of the region though. Past financial plans have therefore also accounted for additional revenues that could reasonably be expected to become available between now and 2050. These new revenues, referred to in the plan as reasonably expected revenues, must be achieved to ensure the future, uh, sorry, that these revenues must be achieved in order to uh, pay for the full uh, amount of strategies and, and projects included in the plan. In the 2022 update, onto 2050 plan, reasonably expected revenues were forecasted to generate an additional $38 billion. These future revenues included uh, tolling highway expansion and reconstruction, replacing the motor fuel tax with a road usage fee or charge. Uh, as a reminder, a road usage charge uh, is where drivers pay based on the number of miles that are, they travel uh, to generate revenues for, transportation, for the transportation system by charging drivers uh, based on how often they use it. The ONTU 2050 update also included expanding the sales tax base to include services, which was forecasted to generate an additional $9 billion in revenues. And the ONTU 2050 update also included uh, implementing a regional fee on transportation network companies, or TNCs, They're your Ubers and Lyfts, uh, as well as expanding the local pricing and parking fees. Combined with baseline revenues, the ONTU 2050 update forecasted a total fiscal constraint of $526 billion. So that's on the revenue side, but then we move over to the expenditure side. On the expenditure side, the total fiscal constraint was spread across the categories identified here in this chart. Uh, we start with baseline expenditures. These are the costs associating with administrating, operating, and maintaining the existing, the existing system in its existing condition. Combined, this accounts for over 80% of the transportation system's total expenditure cost. The remaining costs include the improve improvements to existing system that would be required to meet uh, the performance targets that are set in the plan, improvements to the system that would meet other regional goals such as uh, pedestrian and bicycle improvements, ADA improvements, intelligent technology systems, and other enhancements to the system. And finally, the cost to expand the transportation system. The final step of the financial planning process has historically been to, to bring those two pieces together. Baseline revenues and costs associated with operating and maintaining the system have generally limited the level of additional investment that might be possible while reasonably expected revenues have provided a way to expand the fiscal constraint and account for the costs of adding more capacity to the system and other system enhancements. For this next RTP, we're building on that foundation but evolving the process a bit to create space for regional dialogue on how we can plan uh, financially for the future. We will continue to forecast baseline revenues and expenditures. But through this process, we're considering how trends like the transition to electric vehicles, changes in fuel taxes, changes in transit ridership, and inflation 
uh, might impact this funding picture. The, the previous plan also had grouped improvements such as pedestrian, bicycle, ADA, ITS, um, and other enhancements into a single bucket. For this plan, um, we plan to put more specificity where possible into that category, breaking them out and having an understanding of uh, what revenues and expenditures we, we expect to see. Uh, to achieve this, we will work with our, ex our implementing partners and other stakeholders to understand how many of these costs are ac already accounted for in project proposals, as well as to look at new data sources, such as the accessibility plans that are currently being updated across the region in uh, line with CMAP's ADA program. We'll also be introducing scenario planning into the process this cycle to help us prepare for different possibilities. Uh, these possibilities include things such as slower than expected revenue streams um, or other uh, inflationary impacts. By considering these scenarios now, we can have more informed decisions later. This approach will help us forecast potential new revenues and highlight trade-offs if funding falls short of expe expectations, helping us to navigate the fiscal constraint federal requirements. For instance, we assumed a road usage charge would be in place, uh, would replace the motor fuel tax by 2025. Uh, it's clear we're, we're a bit away, away from that actually happening. Uh, so scenario planning will show us how the fiscal outlook changes if in this financial plan we say a road usage charge will be in place by 2035 versus if it was in place by 2045. And what does that mean for the revenues we have available for projects? In the end, this process gives us a strategic understanding of our plan's financial limits allowing the region to make informed decisions about transportation investments and explore various possibilities for improving our regional system. We are very excited to kick off the financial uh, stream of work. We are, have already begun collecting up-to-date data on baseline revenues and data on current asset conditions throughout the region, which will allow us to better <coughs> estimate costs. Additionally, over the next couple months, we will be establishing a financial planning resource group comprised of technical experts from our partner agencies who will help advise us through the financial planning process, both, the, both for the baseline forecasts as well as for those future uh, revenue scenarios. Thanks for your time today, uh, and I'm happy to take any questions. Any questions to Ryan? Yes. Mayor Thank Gordon. you. <clears throat> Gary Grosso, um, Village of Burr Ridge Mayor, CMAP board member. Wow. <clears throat> it's It's... Great to see a presentation uh, with this kind of detail focused on a concept I would never think would be put up there, and that is fiscal restraint and trying to plan within the fiscal capabilities, the realistic uh, fiscal capabilities. So uh, you made my morning, probably my day. <clears throat> I learned a lot just in your brief presentation. Well done. Thank you. Um, and, and I like the tone and the message. Um, I think this is the way government should work. Uh, and, uh, and I like this approach very much. And I think it's a breath of fresh air. Thank you, Chairman. Any other comments, questions? Yes, Nina? Yes, thank you for the presentation, uh, Nina, from the CMAP board. And yes, I agree. Uh, budgets with constraints is my life from childhood and also in adulthood working in government. Um, but on that note, I wanted to emphasize or kind of ask you about the prioritization because, again, we still have values as a board. We still have values for the, for the region. I would love for you to talk a little bit about the prioritization and how those values are being used to prioritize. And I, I say this because I know with the Greyhound closing, there's been lots of advocates, transit advocates myself, who just used Greyhound actually a few months ago to go between Lansing and Detroit because there's no train that goes directly. Um, and I'm a millennial who takes public transit. I took the orange line here today and walked. Yay. Um, but obviously, you know, people like me and people who, who need to use public transit need those regional ways to get around, right? And I wanna make sure that those type of regional connections are prioritized in this plan um, because one, it's, it's about the economy, it's about our, 
our footprint and our climate goals. There's all sorts of things that tie into that and also making sure that low income black and brown people have access to, to multiple cities, right, to be able to, to have access to opportunity. Um, and so with that on my mind, I would love to hear kind of like how our values are being used to prioritize what's in that financial constraint. Yeah. Um, so throughout the process, actually in January, we'll be coming back uh, to both the board and MPL policy committee meetings with our proposed approach for um, how we select or how we identify, evaluate, and, and select the, the regional, regionally significant projects. And then we'll go through that analysis um, and evaluation process to bring it back to the board and MPO for consideration and discussion as coupled with those stakeholder forums that'll be happening in the summer as well as um, throughout the scenario planning work that we'll be doing, being able to take in all that information to have a conversation around how do we go about prioritizing it. So at the moment, we don't have the exact evaluation criteria. That's the process that's unfolding. Um, but we will certainly have more information on that in January. OK, then, then I'll, I guess thank you for that information. And my yeah. desire, my direction as a board member is to, is to make sure that that objective criteria understands, like again, our values, which are stated within the plan, which are stated in a lot of our goals, and using that as an objective criteria to prioritize what we're going to put in that financial constraint. And, and yes, that, that is more information that I would like to have um, an eye into as you come back with more updates, because I think that's really important. Again, and I say this all the time to my colleagues, you know, we have to align our values with our budget. And if we are saying we're going to do something, we actually have to put the resources behind it and prioritize that. So just wanted to say that for the record. Thank you. Other questions? And, and understanding as we have over the many, many years is that the fiscal constraints or certainly the revenue constraints are uh, outside of our control, uh, but both state and federal uh, revenue sources uh, taking place. So you wish you also had leadership here in the General Assembly to observe uh, what uh, this is all about. Uh, we've had spurts over the years with uh, surges of, of, of capital investment, but certainly nothing steady. So in consideration of what uh, has been laid out here is is potential revenue, uh, we uh, are, are unfortunate uh, a, a gap away from, from understanding as an entire state the challenges that we need in the, uh, uh, the fiscal investment uh, uh, by sources outside of our control uh, to be a partner in this. So that continues to be a challenge going forward. Mr. Secretary? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, Doctor, uh, go ahead. Correspondent Hadian Sima Board, uh, thank you for the report. and. Uh, I'm, I'm glad that you were considering the decline in transit ridership as well as the transition to <laughs> a, a electric car vehicle. That's, that's great. I would just uh, want to encourage you guys to also consider the population decline and all the depopulation happening in our region in the past you know, a few years. That can be actually just changing your baseline. Secretary? You good? Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, moving on to the climate action uh, plan. Uh, Nora Beck's the principal, but before she gets to speak, I'll turn it over to Caroline. I know you have some comments. You serve as the project steering committee chair. Yes, and thank you for the opportunity to represent the CMAP board on the CAP steering committee. This group, which has its, had its first meeting back in June, includes experts from the public, private, and nonprofit sectors from across the region who bring a diversity in perspectives and knowledge we are charged with guiding and informing the climate action planning process and bringing perspectives around regional priorities and challenges, areas for collaboration, and strategies for implementation. We are committed to working toward the national goal of net zero emissions by 2050 and recognize the importance of ownership for implementation, equity for impacted communities and workers. Today, the CMAP team will provide a project overview and update share regional information around our GHG inventory and emissions and introduce approaches to reduce emissions in the context on, of onto 2050 recommendations and regional priorities. We hope to engage you in a discussion on how we can work together to help our region advance ex existing priorities. So, Nora, thanks. Thanks, Carolyn. Thank you. Go ahead, Nora. My name is Nora Beck. I'm, I use she, her pronouns. I'm a principal and oversee CMAP's climate action program, which includes the project to develop a regional climate action plan for the greater Chicago area. Today, I'm going to provide an update on our progress, highlight what we'll be doing in the coming year, and discuss a sample of greenhouse gas emission reduction strategies we are working on with regional stakeholders. 
But first, I'd like to set the Comprehensive Climate Action Plan for the Greater Chicago Area um, uh, in the context of this larger body of work for the agency. In 2050, the region established a goal of a region prepared for climate change, and, and that to do so, we needed to intensify our climate mitigation efforts. The plan set an aggressive goal of an 80% decline in greenhouse gas emissions relative to 2005 levels by 2050. To achieve this, the plan specifically calls for the development of a regional climate action plan to further chart a path forward. It also recommends greenhouse gas reduction strategies like transitioning to electric vehicles, increasing transit ridership, and advancing renewable energy. So what is CMAP doing to, to act on the region's climate commitments? Two key projects are helping us to identify and prioritize effective strategies for achieving the region's climate goals. The first one is our work to develop a comprehensive climate action plan for the greater Chicago area. I'm gonna, I'll focus on this project during the rest of the presentation. A complementary project, the Clean Energy to Communities Technical Assistance provided via the U.S. Department of Energy, is allowing us to work in partnership with two national laboratories and ComEd and the Respiratory Health Association. Together, we'll explore strategies to transition to a clean transportation system in beneficial and cost-effective ways that work in concert with our electric grid. This first-of-a-kind effort where transportation planners and electric grid planners are working together to understand the needs and constraints of each other's systems will be essential as we advance climate work. We're gonna learn a lot from both of these projects and we, and we hope that they will inform and shape future regional action. Once the climate action plan is complete, we'll work with you uh, to help us identify and advance the most appropriate strategies for the region using the CMAP implementation levers that we have at our disposal. So let's dig into the Comprehensive Climate Action Plan for the Greater Chicago Area. With the passage of the Inflation Reduction Act, unprecedented levels of funding were made available to advance climate work. The US EPA's Climate Pollution Reduction Grant Program is one such example, and it's providing planning funds for all states and metropolitan statistical areas across the country. CMAP partnered with the Metropolitan Mayor's Caucus and our sister agency, NERPSI, in Northwest Indiana to do this work on behalf of the region. And as this slide shows, we are not alone. Nearly every state and major MSA is participating in this program. That means that they are each developing their own climate action plans uh, that are specific to their jurisdictions. As required by the US EPA grant, there are three planning deliverables. First is the Priority Climate Action Plan. And the Metropolitan Mayor's Caucus developed this plan to ensure that the region was eligible for a funding opportunity. CMAP is taking the lead on the next two deliverables, the first of which is the Comprehensive Climate Action Plan, which is due next fall. Before we talk about the plan components, I, I did want to take a moment to reflect on this large geography. The planning area involves 13 counties. It spans three different states and three different MPOs. The plan will provide a framework of strategies that outline a path to reach national goals. It will serve as a springboard for ongoing conversations and planning efforts at the board, MPO, county, municipal levels, as well as state and, the state and federal governments. Following the plan, plan submission to US EPA, CMAP will work with the CMAP's governing committees to learn from the process, identify beneficial paths forward, and confirm implementation action for the CMAP region. So the plan will identify strategies that will help us reach net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. Net zero means cutting greenhouse gas, gases from human activities to as close to zero as possible, with any remaining um, emissions balanced out by natural carbon sinks or removed by other means. There's also a shorter term goal to cut greenhouse gas emissions by 50% by 2030, 2035. These two targets are consistent with the intent of ONTI 2050 and the national and international goals to avoid the worst impacts of climate change. Creating the plan will follow roughly six steps and we are engaging stakeholders um, through the plan steering committee, the working groups and other avenues for their implementation and technical expertise. First, we worked with stakeholders to establish guiding principles to help us navigate the path ahead. Second, we created a greenhouse gas inventory for the area to estimate emissions by each major sector. Now we are identifying strategies to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and to avoid potential negative impacts for communities. Next, we will estimate how those strategies impact emissions and create scenarios to understand different paths we could take to reach our reduction goals. Then we'll analyze how the strategies we've selected can benefit communities. 
And then finally, we will complete our climate action plan by the fall of next year. At the outset of this project, we wanted to establish guiding principles with our steering committee to confirm the values that they want to bring to the process and, hope, and use these to guide us through potential dis difficult decision making that we may encounter in the future. At our first meeting, we learned from the steering committee about, about their go own goals and principles and how they think we should collectively approach this task. After further iterations with members, we have drafted these four principles to guide us. Commit to zero by embracing transformative strategies that accelerate the region's progress towards net zero emission targets. Center equity by seeking to reduce existing disparities for underserved and marginalized communities, designing strategies to maximize benefits, and advancing an inclusive energy transition. Plan for action by prioritizing actions that move the region towards short and long-term goals, and by collaborating with stakeholders to ensure the plan recommendations are relevant, realistic, and actionable. And then finally, grow a clean economy by harnessing the economic opportunities of climate action to foster innovation, create quality jobs, and position the, re the region as a leader in the clean economy. We've shared our greenhouse gas emissions inventory um, in previous meetings, but I just wanted to do a quick refresh um, and highlight how the CMAP region uh, compares to this larger 13 county area. In 2020, the 13 counties produced approximately 166 million metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent. And as you know, the larger Chicago region plays an important role as a national transportation and manufacturing hub. Given our existing energy sources, these activities produce significant greenhouse gas emissions and make the, major, the region a major contributor to the national emissions profile. From this map of emissions by county, you can see that higher proportions of emissions are associated with our more heavily populated areas and industry clusters. Our seven county region makes up a majority or nearly 70% of the total planning area's emissions. However, there are some distinct differences between us and the rest of the area. And you can see that best in this next slide as we take a peek at emissions by sector. Just a quick orientation on this slide, our 13 county planning area emissions are shown on the left and a subset of those emissions for the seven county um, CMAP region are on the right. Just comparing the sizes of the, of the buildings and the transportation across the two bars, you can see that the vast majority of building emissions, about 90%, occur within the CMAP region and the vast majority of transportation emissions, about 82%, occur within the CMAP region. This same pattern is not true for industrial emissions, where the CMAP region has about a third of the total, and the other two-thirds are in Indiana, and more specifically, Lake County, Indiana. So to reach national goals, an array of reduction measures are, will be needed across all these sectors. Regardless of the sector, the measures generally fall into three main approaches. The first is to avoid or use less energy. In the building space, this could mean improvements to the building envelope. Uh, to reduce heat loss. In the transportation space, this could mean moving trips to transit, walking, and biking. Second, to use low carbon solutions. This approach focuses on shifting the energy source to lower carbon emitting sources. That includes renewable energy, low carbon fuels, and electrification. Switching from on-site combustion to electricity, whether it's in your home or in your car, is more efficient and reduces greenhouse gas emissions. And third, sequester emissions. Natural lands and assets with technological approaches can be used to remove greenhouse gas emissions from sources that are particularly hard to eliminate via the other two options. There are synergies between all three of these approaches, and there are clear advantages of using some over others in specific locations. Our will, work will recognize the distinct assets and conditions in each county and the corresponding effectiveness of the strategies uh, to reaching our goal. Well, this is the first time that CMAP is working with partners to draft a comprehensive climate action plan. Many of the strategies are not new to the agency. CMAP has been engaged and working to advance many of these recommendations for years. In the next slide, just using that same framing that I stepped through, we've identified just a sample set of measures where CMAP has already advanced implementation, either through policy research and development, programming and investment decisions, data provision, and local te planning technical assistance. We've worked in these areas given the importance of these strategies for meeting a variety of other regional priorities. So as I close, I wanted to pose a question. 
our, our role here is to make sure we lift up regional priorities and we help our communities and implementers make these a reality. How, how do we help our region move forward with these existing priorities? How else can we be advancing these strategies? Thank you. Back to you. Carolyn? Okay, thanks. Thank you, Nora. As we know, our role at CMAP is to use our levers that Nora talked about to move the needle on our regional and national climate goals. We can lean into and learn from local partners who are leading in this area like McHenry County. The McHenry County Board's 2022 to 2025 strategic plan identifies environmental sustainability as a key issue area. They have a website de dedicated to communicating progress towards their goals and the strategies and actions to achieve them. For example, McHenry County has a 15-year decarbonization plan which includes a greenhouse gas inventory and benchmarking the county's emission sources and establishing an emission baseline. The result has been used to make significant progress on reducing energy consumption at county facilities. In 2008, McHenry County government buildings consumed 14.3 million kilowatt hours of electricity. By 2023, McHenry County facilities reduced this amount by 43% to 8.8 .8 million. The county I represent has identified existing priorities. How do we help and support our partners and implementers to advance these? So back to you, Nora, to facilitate that. Yeah. Thank you. No, I'm sorry. Yeah, well, well, I think I'll just share that there are lots of really great things that are going on locally across communities and counties that are already setting the wheels in motion because as we think about reducing our energy consumption, right, there are these co-beneficial um, outcomes, right? You're, you're saving costs, you're saving money, and at the same time, we're also reducing our, our greenhouse gas uh, or carbon emissions impact too. And so I think the question to the committee uh, members, whether you're in the transportation space or in the local government space, which I guess are kind of the same, one and the same as well. Uh, how else can we be thinking about supporting you all through this process? Yeah. So just a, just a thought is, is I think, you know, you overall look at this whole situation. Somehow we've got to get ComEd to come to the table with a plan for upgrading their system and modifying their system in order to accommodate electrification and any additional, you know, add-ons to their existing system. I mean, from a transit standpoint, we've got that internally based upon where our, our garages are or whatever the case may be. Um, but quite frankly, even moving forward, um, you know, industries, you know, they, they obviously know where all the industries are. What, if there is gonna be additional electrification or other, you know, other demands on their system, are they prepared for it? And quite frankly, I, you know, I'm looking for a detailed plan from ComEd to come forward. I'm not looking at the CEO to stand up in front of everybody and saying, we're ready, we're ready, because they're not. I mean, you, you talk to municipalities from the standpoint of economic development and everything else, they can't even provide transformers. So I think, you know, as we look at this, an important part of it is we can do all the things that we're talking about doing, which I, I believe is good, but ComEd is, is the missing link. And without some major commitment from them moving forward, and maybe that needs to be done legislatively, I don't know, but I don't think we're gonna make a tremendous impact, you know, unless that happens. Because the companies are gonna look at it and say, well, I'm not gonna invest if I, you know, if I've gotta put money in the ComEd system in order for me to accommodate this. Mayor, go ahead. Uh, I'd like to completely support those comments as well, but uh, I had a good fortune in our community uh, to be a part of a, a session that brought out several members of the legislature and the solar industry recently on uh, at a facility which we're proud to have in, in Romeoville that is one of the largest solar rooftop installations that actually provides complete power for a manufacturing facility, uh, which you don't hear very often. Uh, and, but the topic of discussion was the current efforts to uh, support battery capacity uh, to go along with this. You know, we, when we look at alternative energies, we need to be looking at the entire, not only the, the infrastructure grid, as the chairman mentioned, which is highly important, 
uh, but things like you know capacity to hold when you have the ability to generate that that energy source, uh, and especially if you're on facilities that then can pr in, it, it generate additional capacity above and beyond their own needs. Um, and promote that not only on the small scale, but on the larger scale as well, uh, in order to make sure that we are maximizing the energy that we're generating today, uh, because we need to get as much as we can and hold as much as we can for high peak usage periods, uh, but we also still need to be t discussing how are we gonna produce enough electricity, how are we gonna get it there, how are we gonna create the infrastructure to, to implement it, um, which are all, important things and it's part of this and with that too on that topic again and I br brought this up in the past and I brought it up it, thankfully with the members of the Senate in the House that were there from the state um, that uh, the continuing desire uh, to work more diligently on rooftop solar installations versus greenfield we are still putting too much time and effort and seeing too much investment in my opinion and many of my colleagues opinion and destroying open green fields uh, with solar installations rather than maximizing the ability to utilize existing rooftop space. Um, you know, there are hundreds of millions of square feet of existing uh, rooftop space that it, with today's technology and as light as they are, that require less retrofitting and could allow us to install this. We need to find creative ways to entice the industry um, and those users to install those so that we're not wasting uh, perfectly good green space uh, when we could be doing it in a more efficient way, in my opinion. So I hope others will join me in that. Yeah, further comments? Go ahead, Nick. I always have a comment. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I also agree with my colleagues about thinking about um, kind of the use of electricity and batteries. Um, it's kind of on a different scale for me of thinking about the unintended, unintended consequences of electrification in, in the sense of um, in the continent in Congo, you know, the strip of materials and, and how that has a, an effect. And so like what we do here and how we move forward has an effect globally and we should be thinking about that. I know people um, in my generation care, care about that deeply. Um, actually people across the generations think about that differently. Actually, let, let me not make that generalization. Um, another thing that I wanted to talk about or emphasize is kind of like a co the communal way of kind of like that energy saving. I know, you know, with with my work in government, whether it be in Los Angeles or Chicago or not a nonprofit, uh, um, it's kind of not disingenuous, but uh, short sighted to just say like, oh, go get a Prius or, you know, you know, retrofit your home. It's kind of like, what are the communal ways in which we can think about energy saving, whether it be, you know, if it, if it is electrification, maybe it's not about the individual, but like our fleets and how we're shipping things, right? Um, and I agree with like, how do we use existing buildings for solar? You know, how do we incorporate that into our development plans? I know I've worked in cities in which that is required at certain stages. And so like, how do we explore that on a regional level? And then obviously I've always been an advocate for equitable transit oriented development, which also helps with that, right? Um, and so these are all things that are more on the community level and not necessarily just on the individual mm -hmm. level, because mm -hmm. again, we're, we're, we're in the climate crisis now we are seeing it and um, each person has to do their part but in a way that's equitable to them so you know you can't ask every i have an electric car but you can't ask everybody to go get an electric car so like what are the ways in which community regardless of your status in life or how much money you make community is is contributing to to that so that that would be my comment and wish but i i love the work that you all have done for so far and thank you for the report thank you thank you Norm. thanks and caroline Moving on to the uh, Regional Safe Streets uh, for All grant program update. We have two speakers, right? So Lindsay mm -hmm. Bailey and uh, Elaine is the bottom line. Yeah. Welcome. Good morning. My name is Lindsay Bailey again, and I am the program lead for Safe and Complete Streets. Uh, today, I'm going to give you an update on our work to improve traffic safety with a focus on what we are doing with this grant. Uh, we also, as Mayor Bennett mentioned, we also have Elaine Bottomley from Will County to hear about their experience. So next slide. Many of you have seen this chart before. Uh, we really began our strong efforts in this area because we have seen an increase in traffic fatalities 
since 2014, which happens to be the first year that SUVs and small trucks overtook sedans in the market share of vehicles on our roads. We are seeing similar trends for people walking and biking as far as fatalities and serious injuries increasing. Next slide. We also know that these impacts are not shared evenly across the region. Here we know that black residents have fatality rates more than three times higher than white residents. Next slide. And on top of these tragic lives lost, there are additional impacts. Each one of those people who loses their life on the roadway has friends and family and they are impacted by the loss of life. Probably all of us in this room know someone who is impacted by traffic violence. And we, we're seeing over 30,000 people a year injured on our roadways. Those deaths, injuries, the lost quality of life, and the emotional toll on loved ones all adds up. And the USDOT has calculated that cost incurred to our, to our region amounts to over $25 billion annually. And to address this traffic safety crisis, CMAP established the STAR program. This is a five-year effort to improve travel safety, looking at data collection and analysis, policy recommendations, and local planning projects and implementation assistance. These, the development of local safety action plans is part of the STAR program to improve traffic safety. Other work in the region that, or with CMAP that you've probably heard about includes our speed management paper, our data efforts to um, disseminate important travel safety data. We have bicycle and pedestrian and community mobility plans. We did a project to assess the economic impact of complete streets and a lot more that's going on. And this uh, SS4A program is funded by a large grant from the federal government with IDOT and the counties contributing. CMAP has contracted with consultants to develop these countywide safety action plans for six counties. And it is all going to be based on our internally developed regional framework. And we again want to thank IDOT and the participating con counties for their contributions, both funding and the efforts that they are putting in so many meetings. So I'm going to start with a little bit more on what a safety action plan is and tell you about where we are. So up here on the screen we have the definition from the USDOT of what a safety action plan is. The three important takeaways here are that our goal is to eliminate and reduce fatal and serious injury crashes. We're not quite as concerned about fender benders. We want to stop this loss of life on our roads. Second, what we're looking at is based on data analysis that is used to inform the location of our roadway safety concerns. And third, this plan will include the identification of projects, strategies, and policies that will reduce risk and eliminate serious injury and fatal crashes. Our safety action plans are guided by a safe system approach to transportation. The traditional approach to traffic safety has historically been that crashes and roadway deaths are an unfortunate but inevitable part of our transportation system and that human behavior is to blame. This safe systems approach is a shift in this thinking to create a culture of safety to increase collaboration across all of our stakeholders and refocus our design and operation so that we can anticipate those mistakes that people will inevitably make and reduce the impact forces and kinetic energy so that we can save lives. And the six key principles of a safe system approach shown around that circle on the screen are that death and serious injury on our roadways are it's unacceptable. People make mistakes and humans are vulnerable. So we have a shared responsibility for safety, and safety is proactive, and redundancy of safety measures is critical and needed. So now I'm gonna talk through our project purpose and ways that communities can benefit from having an adopted safety action plan. Um, let's see, yeah, we are while each county is on a slightly different timeline, for the most part, there 
wrapping up the first phase of existing conditions. And next we'll be moving into identifying potential strategies and prioritizing those. And then the final phase will be to uh, prepare the plans. And throughout this we will have public and stakeholder engagement and an equity analysis. Next slide. Um, oh, and I did also want to mention that we worked closely with Federal Highway to ensure that the county plans would meet the requirements that would enable municipalities to be eligible for implementation funding as if safety needs are identified. And we're putting additional resources into creating an equitable engagement campaign to advance the Federal Justice 40 initiative and focus resources where they're most needed to our most vulnerable residents. So this is a screenshot of our website hub for the, all of the six county pages. And each one has a link with a blue box where you can click on that that will take you to the county, individual county websites. So for example, if you had clicked on that Will County one, it would take you to this page, uh, which on the right hand has the events listed and links to learn more and further down we have this safety hotspots interactive map and a survey next slide and this is just a screenshot there's probably more points already on here now because i did this last week but we have a lot of stakeholders and residents inputting their experiences and their travel safety concerns on the website and we're also going out to the communities so um at this point, I'm going to hand it over to Elaine to talk about what they're doing in Will County. Great. Thank you, Lindsay. Always happy to take a moment to talk a little bit about Will County. Um, before I really start, thank you for having me. Excited to talk about this project. I really want to say thank you to Eric Wessel, who is here today with me to provide some backup and support. He is our day-to-day -day lead on this project out of the Will County DOT. Um, my name is Elaine Bottomley. I'm out of the Will County Executive's Office, and we're helping to provide some additional support. But truly, Eric is the one day-to-day -day pushing this project along and making sure it has the support that it needs. What we're seeing in Will County is applying a regional framework and a regional initiative into a complex county. I think we all know that Will County is a little bit of everything, right? We have rural, urban, and suburban, making this a challenging planning exercise. Um, so I have a couple of slides. We're gonna talk a little bit about data, a little bit about public engagement, and what our overall experience has been so far. So um, as you can see uh, on this slide, we have data from 2018 to 2022, and it's giving us a picture of what our current conditions are. Um, you can see that our crashes are primarily motorists, which isn't too shocking given the framework of what currently exists in Will County from a land use perspective. Um, I, I think it's also interesting to point out that when you look at this extrapolated to fatal and serious injury crash rate per thousand residents, Elwood is uh, our number one municipality seeing crashes that exist. Um, for those of you that don't know, that is right by the largest inland intermodal port in the country. Uh, it really speaks to the perception that residents in Will County have that driving amongst trucks and freight and it being a pedestrian in those spaces is unsafe and challenging. So as we go to the next slide, um, a majority of our accidents, I'm sorry, crashes, not accidents. I know Lindsay's gonna yell at me later for saying that, sorry. Um, it's been a learning process going through this, right? It's rephrasing and relearning what to say. It's not an accident, right? And it has taken me a, a long time to reframe that in my mind, and I hope this now sticks with you all as well. It's not accidents, it is crashes. But uh, majority of our crashes are on our surface streets and in our urban areas. Uh, we do have rural and we do have rural crashes, but um, again, primarily focused in our urban spaces. Uh, as we go to our next slide, uh, our consultant team has worked on gathering information about these crashes and with conversations with municipalities, as well as taking some uh, additional data from our residents through public engagement to draft our high injury network. So if it is a red line, it is a potential high injury corridor that has a higher level of crashes, be it through um, just motor vehicles or pedestrians as well. So as we go to the next slide, 
one of the big things that I want to talk about is our public engagement. Um, so on our next slide, you'll see a brief overview of what we've done so far from a public engagement standpoint. We're not just looking at crash data. We're also engaging with our public. I think we all know of an intersection that we won't cross or an intersection we're going to avoid because of near misses. And capturing that data and that information is really impactful to potential recommendations and improvements that we could make. Uh, from our online engagement, we've had 416 contributions. Uh, we've had 371 locations added onto our hotspot map. Uh, we were out at the Will County Fair directly engaging with residents. That's where this photo is from. We had a great map. People were able to come up, talk to us about their experiences. Uh, at the fair, we gathered 112 data points and identified 50 additional hotspots, all from talking with 102 residents. We've presented at Will County Governmental League, which is our, our COG in the area, as well as hosting a community open house that had 25 attendees that was over at the Ovation Center in Romeoville, Mayor Noak, a beautiful facility. Um, and this is just the beginning, right? We're in phase one. We're looking forward to, to going into phase two. Our consultant team of WSP and Cran Strategies has done a really great job navigating the unique systems that exist within Will County. And we really are looking forward to the next steps of this planning effort, uh, which is really only possible with the support from our CMAP team, our consultants. Um, but especially, I want to thank our, our key municipal partners, uh, especially today in the room, Mayor John Noak. Romeoville's been active in this conversation, sharing their input, helping us shape this so it's a usable planning effort, not just for the county, but for our municipal partners as well. So um, with that, we know that this is really going to be truly impactful for Will County residents and for our municipalities to implement as well. Thank you so much, Elaine, and I wish we could hear from all of the counties today. We have some of the representatives here in the room, but we don't want to take all of your time. But um, obviously, having this plan in place is not our end goal. We want to improve safety, which means that we need to implement the recommendations. So upon the completion of having a safety action plan, communities in the region will be eligible to apply for funding through this program to build out the recommendations. So this slide is just showing some examples of projects that have been funded through this program uh, by implementation grants. So we have some for infrastructure, and the next slide, we have some examples of uh, funded projects that address operational safety, and the next slide that is coming. And um, we also will look at strategies and policies that we can implement. All right, next slide. So as I mentioned at the beginning, all of these county plans are based on that regional framework and that we are adjusting as we learn. And at the end of this process, we also will have a framework for how CMAP can continue to advance this very important work. So I think Elaine and I are both happy to take any questions at this point. Any questions? I've got I'd one. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry, who's up? Good. Mayor? Thank you. Um, so we're in the midst of an ongoing reconstruction of 294. It certainly affects my life a lot. I'm on it frequently. So how did your programs interact with, with the redevelopment and the, and the tollway uh, board uh, to increase safety uh, for the redevelopment of 294? Oh, that's an excellent question. And if we'd started many years ago, we would have that conversation, but we're kind of just getting going with our existing conditions analysis, and the next phase is where we start those conversations with all of the regional stakeholders. So projects like that will be very important, and we're really happy to have IDOT at the table to work with us to address some of the traffic safety concerns. Well, maybe well, uh, I, Director I just Rouse want, might have so some insights it, as well. Yeah, so, I mean, you mean the 294 project was not we weren't started. I know. Okay. So, okay. Fair enough. But, but let me offer, Director Rouse, I think this is a great opportunity for this cross-board uh, MPO conversation because I know safety is top of mind for her and her team as they go through that reconstruction process. Mm -hmm. Yes, Director thank Rouse. you so much. I'm Cassandra Rouse, Executive Director, Illinois Tollway. Um, first, I'd like to say thank you um, for the presentation this morning. And also, um, just to highlight, yes, we all know it's a nationwide issue that fatalities across the system has, has you know, increased at a level that is unacceptable. 
So from, from an Illinois Tollway perspective, um, we take that um, very seriously and across our system for every incident that happens, whether it results in a fatality or it's an accident, we analyze those scenarios to understand, you know, why. And um, we, you know, have a great handle on, you know, what we call our hot spots in the system where we know that we need to, to revisit and evaluate on how we can uh, make sure that we're reducing incidents in those areas. So it is an active priority of the tollway. We do monitor it and manage it, and I definitely welcome the opportunity to be a part of this um, um, effort that, you know, CMAP is currently, um, you know, underway with, um, we're doing and implementing, and um, we are there as partners to make sure, again, across the region, that we are ensuring the safety for all of our motorists. So thank you. Thank, thank you. you, Mayor Nope. Um, having participated uh, uh, in, in this process, I just can't say enough about the project team. I think they're doing an excellent job in all the counties. Um, and I think this is probably one of the best processes we've had. Why I, in, and I encourage everyone to participate, is because this goes from the smallest intersections to the biggest ones. It's not just the ones we'll hear about on the news, and 294 is important, but it goes to all those small things that real people day to day find as a challenge, whether it's in a vehicle or they're in a pedestrian, or they're on a bicycle, whatever mode they may be taking, this is a real life interaction. Uh, you know, I, I personally put on uh, 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 notes on the map. I mean, it's a great way to do this with, for people. It's real. They can feel it. They can see it. They can talk about it. And I think that uh, I, I just am very excited to see where this project can continue to go. Um, I think it's incredibly important. And what it does is also provides an opportunity for all those multi-jurisdictional intersections and issues to really have a real dialogue. You know, oftentimes, especially in our region, uh, you could be dealing with a area that, of concern that can involve uh, a multitude of different entities, everything from a township to the village, or maybe it be the county, or the state, or, or the tollway maybe. You know, it, it, those things can often overlap. An area of concern may have multiple jurisdictions involved, and this format allows for that conversations to start to emerge. You know, just from the, it, the session that we had in Will County, uh, I know that some good dialogue occurred with us with some of the neighboring jurisdictions and overlapping jurisdictions about potential resolutions whether they're the ones that are highlighted during this process or the ones that we engage in separately. I think that it's incredibly important to have this uh, process. Um, I also uh, just want to take a quick moment. I want to thank uh, the Wood County Executive's Office on leading the effort. You know, we're, as was indicated, our county, and there are other counties like that, is very diverse in its range of land use and uh, density throughout the county. It's a very big county as well and creates a unique set of challenges. Uh, but the county executive's office really engaged in on their roadways a better process of working on you know, trails and bikes and pedestrian crossings uh, for the first time in the county's history to bring that out. And I really want to thank them and that foresight in working on that. And uh, if anybody wants to see uh, what a complete streets project looks like in the suburbs, we just completed one. Uh, just a few weeks ago, in fact, uh, to connect two major routes in the region of uh, being Weber Road and Route 53 uh, and have a connection along 135th Street with a complete streets uh, philosophy in mind. And so if you want to add some pictures of one that's in, actually in the area, because a few of those I think were outside the area, uh, but that's okay. We're just getting newer ones. Uh, feel free to come out. We'd love to show everyone uh, one of these. But I do think that as part of this process too, uh, we need to continue to educate the public, especially the suburban public and sometimes that what Complete Streets, why it's really important and what it really means uh, to their lives and to the lives of others that uh, maybe they're not interacting with. Maybe they don't understand the limitations they have in their, their transit or mobility needs. And so uh, we need to continue to educate people why these types of projects are important and why including those kind of design elements are important going forward. So, but again, I just think that that this group's doing a fantastic job. I think this is one of the better things we've done in a while, and I look forward to its outcomes. Thank you. Thank you very much. One more, I'm sorry. Just, just Will County Day or what, huh? <laughs> just, no, I'm not gonna reach it. Well, I'm gonna talk a little bit about both, but um, one thing, uh, you know, and, and I think this is a great program. I think it's something that everybody should participate in because I think we've all, from different agencies, have different levels of 
safety that we're trying to improve, but it, but it takes cooperation um, you know, throughout everyone. Um, just one of the things about the metrics that you guys used on like population base, you know, I, I'd encourage you to look at some other use other than just population, um, primarily because when you do look at Elwood, it's like, yes, there are some fatalities in Elwood, but some of them are on I-55 in Elwood, like zip code, if you will, or whatever the case may be. Or they might be on state highways or county highways or whatever the case may be. Um, so I think there may be a, a better way to kind of like look at that. Um, the other aspect of it is too, I think part of what we need to include, and this is something from a PACE perspective, we've had constant issues forever, as long as I can remember. Um, and we've got a great relationship with IDOT where we're able to work with IDOT as they do road improvements to work on bus stop areas, bus pull-in areas in some cases, on some corridors. Um, I can tell you we are not that successful with the municipal governments. And some of them are great, they work with us, and some of them don't. And you can look at some of our routes that go down a particular street where we've got good pull-in areas where we could stop for our buses. We've got bus shelters and protected areas. And then there's some areas where we've basically just got a pole on the ground with a sign and no sidewalk and anything. And I think that's where, you know, it could be really important from, from CMAP standpoint to say, hey, if you're going to continue to get funding for some things, you're going to have to provide sidewalks. You're going to have to, you know, provide, you know, uh, the ability for some of the safety for people, uh, you know, boarding transit and so forth. A couple other things to look at too are these motor scooters that the young kids are, are driving. I'm telling you, I, I've seen it every morning if I go for coffee, there's kids on their way to school on these things going 15, 20 miles an hour, and literally you don't see them. And somehow, I mean, maybe that needs to be addressed again through the legislature or whatever. Um, you know, I, and maybe, maybe, I don't know if anybody else is seeing that, but you know, I know it's like that in the city, but out in the suburbs, it's, it, I mean, they're, they're moving. And, um, and it's dangerous because you can't react that quick. Um, the other thing, too, is just, this is just for your own, everyone's purpose or whatever. Somebody needs to do, like, a little educational thing on, on the roundabouts. Because people come up to those and it's like, where? Where do I go? What lane do I go in? And they can be striped however they are. Maybe through the Secretary of State's office, you know, when people got to take tests or whatever. But I'm even talking about like young kids. I mean, somebody, we need to educate people on that because these things are starting to pop up all over the place. And I can't tell you how many times, like, I'm driving with my daughter. My daughter goes, which lane do I get in? I'm like, just follow the arrows. You'll be fine. But, um, you know, it, I think it's just coming up and seeing cars. So I think that's something that, you know, maybe can be addressed somehow um, just with education. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much. Moving on to uh, the executive committee report, uh, Stephanie. And while Stephanie gets up here, I'm just going to opine on one thing that uh, Chair Kwasniewski brought up here is that, that, you know, the opportunity that we have uh, across both of these boards is our funding policy decisions, right? So if we truly want to make a difference in some of these big issues, we really need to be thinking about how we change or shift our mindset around the way that we fund and how we holistically approach some of these projects. So I'm glad you raised that. Um, I think as we thought, think through some of these bigger projects that we've been talking about, our next year of work really is going to be how do we bring these things to fruition with the tools and levers that we have as a regional body and where all will you want to be a part of that conversation? Stephanie. Good morning. Uh, this is just our standard report. Uh, we typically give it to the executive committee, but because the executive committee is not meeting uh, this month, uh, we're presenting it to the board. And it's really just a summary of the grants and procurements uh, that occurred in the month of September. Thank you, Stephanie. I think unless there are any questions, it is just for informational purposes for everyone. Thank you. That's the way our commi executive committees run, right? About three minutes. Uh, we're down to the end here. And finally, you have the uh, state legislative uh, update. John, welcome. 
Good morning. I have a very brief report. Um, as Aaron mentioned earlier, we are actively involved in monitoring and um, uh, meeting with members of the Senate Transportation Committee. Uh, the, the committee is now nearing completion of its series of hearings around the region and the state to hear, uh, to get input on opportunities to improve transit service. The last transit hearing is scheduled uh, for next week, October 16th in Springfield. That one will, fo will focus on the importance of investing in downstate transit. Uh, CMAP staff will continue to uh, monitor the hearings and provide input as necessary. The 2025 and 2026 legislative advocacy agenda um, is currently being updated. We're in the process of doing that right now, and we will present a draft uh, for discussion at the November CMAP meeting, board meeting. CMAP's advocacy agenda is developed every two years uh, based on onto 2050 and a strategic direction to ensure we are building on and advancing the region's goals outlines, outlined in these documents. The advocacy agenda is used to inform policymakers and elected officials uh, with concrete and tangible actions in the focus areas of transportation, climate, and regional economic competitiveness. That's my report. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Hey, go ahead, Carolyn. I just, I, I, and I just wanted to make um, one uh, notation that I just found out this morning, actually, the Senate hearing is changed to yeah. October 15th, so Tuesday at 10 a.m. in room 212 in, in, at the Capitol. So I just wanted to say that. And then the other thing I wanted to follow up, and I noted, um, you know, you had included the House Committee, the working group in there. and. I just wanted to make note, while McHenry County is really well represented on the Senate Transportation um, Committee hearings, that we are not represented at all on the House Working Group. And I think we're the only county in the region does, that doesn't have representation on that group. And I just um, was hoping that maybe, they, I don't know if CMAP is having any involvement with that, but um, we do, I know it's, it's done by caucus on the Working Group. and. But we do have one Democrat representative in McHenry County. Um, so it's just transit shouldn't be partisan in nature. And I was just hoping that we could be included because it looks like they specifically included those representatives in the region and didn't include anyone um, downstate or anything. But um, it would be nice to have representation from McHenry County on there. You're not the first person to uh, express that opinion. Uh, but it was the speaker's decision to invite people. And uh, others have tried to get on the committee and were denied. So. That's the process that he's implemented. Any other questions, legislative? Under other business, uh, I would like to recognize Nina. Congratulations, Cranes oh. nominated you with a, one of the 40 under 40 executives uh, as they do annually. Congratulations for Thank that. You. Thank you. Mr. Secretary, you have any other business? If there, are there any other businesses before the MPO Policy Committee? Thank you. It's, it's, uh, before we get into public comment, yeah, it's been a very in informative meeting. Uh, and to have both groups here is, uh, uh, just improves the uh, spirit of, of uh, cooperation and where we're going forward with, the, with, the, uh, with our, our various committees. Uh, there is, if there's public comment, uh, we will take them now. I'll, I'll just highlight that, that every member, both the MPO and the, the CMAP board's place, you do have um, written comment that we received two public comments prior to the meetings, one from an Ethan Salzberg uh, regarding the North Lakeshore to Seville Drive and um, thinking about uh, widening of facilities, and then also another public comment from Hayden Harris uh, regarding expansion of the Forest Park Blue Line. Um, so if you uh, could please uh, take a look at those. They are both verbatim uh, as received from those two public individuals. Thank you. No other comments? Any other comments? I'm checking. Do you have one from, um, online? Do we have somebody online? We, Go ahead. Oh, we do. Garland. Of course. Good morning, everybody. It's Garland Armstrong, formerly of Des Plains, now Illinois, now living in Des Moines, Iowa. How's everybody doing in the Chicagoland area? I think we're all doing great, Carlin. Thank you. And come back anytime soon, please. All right. We're, we're here in Ankeny at the Pizza Ranch Buffet having ourselves a little lunch, and I'm listening to y'all. And I just want to, and I want to give kudos to those um, down there, especially holding off Greyhound, because they were almost completely losing a bus depot, and that was my biggest concern 
when my, especially when my mother is, if, if I would have to get that confirmation call of her passing, I would have to use that because like they said, it's a good part of transportation. And I want to give kudos for y'all holding it off and y'all working it out. And also too, I want to echo what Richard Karnowski says, especially when there's not enough, um, especially where the bus stops in the side grassy area where there's no sidewalks. Well, we also have that same thing here too. And Richard Kwanowski, you should tell him too, here in Des Moines, especially dark, there, there are two um, communities that will no longer have paratransit and they're gonna be, because they're worrying about the taxes, tax rate here, and they're pulling out and and that's gonna be a problem for the communities and with where we are at right here because there won't be any buses or the or the paratransit going in in either of those communities. So just give just tell them at pace about what's happening here, what's gonna be happening here in Des Moines, Iowa. It's it's in Grimes, yeah. Iowa, and also in Pleasant Hill, Iowa, that there won't be any paratransit or the buses running. They're pulling out of it and and also making sure that Pace understands what's going on. And if that ever happens in the Chicagoland area, in any community, I think y'all need to make sure what to do next if the unthinkable does confirm. So though, that's my that's my um, concern about that. And also too, especially for the climate, I'm glad that y'all working on the part to make sure to get it down, down to zero because definitely, especially the in the ADA community, because they need fresh air and we don't, want them to end up in a hospital or die so fast. So that's why that's why the ADA needs to live longer and not dying faster. So so we just want to concern about that. Make sure that they that they live life to the fullest like non-disabled people do because they're part of it of society. And also too I want to give kudos to Mayor Shelke from me and Heather, for you being the longest mayor of the mall, and also you rock it, Mayor Shelke, because you are you are certainly a rock star from from the both of us because you have definitely showed the seniors who are disabled and also who are active, shown them that we can be a part of it and and making them understand what is what. So you're one of a kind, and I want to give kudos to both of you to to you. So that's all I have to say. If you have any questions or comments, I'll be glad to hear from y'all. Your mic's not on. Can't hear. Can't hear you. You hear that, Garland? What's that? You, probably, I I you probably didn't realize that that. Mayor Shelke and myself, along oh, with Mayor Tamburino, Tamburino from Hillside, all have oh. are are all now in our forty fourth year as mayor. How's that? Well, you give kudos to all of y'all because you definitely are rock stars, and make sure to keep up the good work until you say that when your time is up, make sure you pass it on to the other person who who will do the same thing like y'all did. So kudos to all of y'all. Thanks, Garland. Thank uh, as Chair of CMAP, I'll, for the board members, I'll attend a motion to adjourn if there's no other business. So moved. Second, right Moving right second. All in favor, six, by unusual manner. Aye. Motion carried, media adjourned. Mr. Secretary? Uh, likewise, uh, for the MPO <laughs> Policy Committee, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Second. second. All in favor, say aye. Aye. All opposed, say nay. The motion Thank you all. Aye.